Yep, that's Beautiful. right. Beautiful. You have a match with Rayu or Ken later on. No. <laughs> Some, I didn't know that. Uh, Is that Street Fighter? Yes. I didn't know Kid and Play was getting back together and needed a guitar player. <laughs> ah. Oh, that's- that's it. That's it. Fat chance of that. They don't use, know what a guitar is. Are they both arcade and play both still among the living? I don't know. Hold on. Hey, blasphemers. Welcome to Simple Blasphemy, where we have the best times with the worst topics. We're three friends that discuss everything and nothing, from wacky headlines to games and trivia. All subjects bizarre and risque are on the table. Our weekly guests range from friends, musicians, and artists to professionals in a variety of industries. Uh We go live on Facebook and YouTube every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. Want to support the show? Join our Patreon. You can find it and more at www.simpleblasphemy.com. So grab a drink and join it! It's too late now. This is Simple Blasphemy. Awesome. All right. Fantastic. Yeah. Boy. All right. Yeah. Here so, we are again. Welcome to the Simple Blasphemy podcast, all you blasphemers out there. My name is Zach Ward, and I have here with me always Andy's. Are you wearing the right masks? Are you wearing a mask at all? Because if you're not, <laughs> go fuck yourself. Okay. And Mr. Whoa. Zach Green. You know, I ask myself every day, how many spins through space and time must I complete? Oh, wow. Any day now, buddy. Okay. It's, I, it's, I, it's actually, it's looping so tightly that I pass myself on the way to work every day. Mm. <laughs> and you know, every time I brush my kids' teeth or help them brush their teeth, I think of you every fucking time. Like, I wonder if this is all my kids are going to remember for me. Is brushing their teeth. It's all right. over and over and over again. And we have our special guest, our friend Meg Tui. How are you doing today, Meg? What's happening, guys? Not a everything. Whole we are excited. Not just excited to have you on. Yes, yep. I'm excited it's, to be. It's here. been many years since uh, mm-hmm. you came out and hung out at reverend it's true it's true. and i don't i remember it well do you i, I was starting to think that she was should. a part of my imagination like the mandela effect like we all died in 2012 and we all have different timelines but did Can you it? come <laughs> and hang out at in, in livonia in yeah. michigan at, at reverend for yeah. like a, a good part of the day because ken was gone and he needed yep. somebody in there to i don't answer calls or whatever but were yeah. you there ward I was there with Nicole yep. and and Mike from the Pumpkins. Yeah, it was we, it was a it out. was an awesome day. A lot of a lot of fun yeah. and laughter. And that's that, and yeah. that's the last time I talked to you. That, that probably, was no no that, that wasn't the last time. And that's how I ended up with my favorite CD. Yeah, <laughs> which we're gonna get to. But that wasn't the last time because Meg Meg was there when we had the prototypes of the Billy Corgan guitar. That's right. Yeah. And despite that's a cool all guitar. I things. Buy it. It's a cool guitar. No. It sounds. The day I'm talking about, you were just there. Um, no, just I, you. Was that that was later on? Was, was it later? Like, yeah, mm-hmm. I feel like that was a later on situation because I came through again on another tour. Because I, I don't doing. remember you with the the rest of the band. Yeah. I just remember you came by, and it was just like yeah. me, you, and and Zach Ward or something. And yeah, you. and I bought I I um I brought my friend Johnny Flower who was playing bass on the tour to check out. The, the new Mike Watt bass that you guys were, were doing. Yes. And he, he was <laughs> we were that. working on that for a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a long time ago. Right, right. And, and so we came by, we were in the middle of wherever, and we were like, oh, we're an hour away from the Reverend guys. Let's go. Mm-hmm. So, that was yeah. awesome. Well, was Reverend Guitars, at least worth an hour's drive. Maybe more. Definitely. Meg, a we, little, yeah. an hour and 40. Eh. 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 So, we're, this show is dedicated all things Meg, so to get to know Meg first, or actually better, first for you, more for us, we're going to spitball four questions or whatever comes up to the top of your head, right. fire away. Um, 
we like to go a little bit deeper on the first question, right, Andy? Oh, so boy. here we go. Oh. If you had a superpower, what would it be? Come on. You got to fly. Okay. You got to fly. You avoid the traffic. You can, like, you know, perch. But okay. she <laughs> lived, get away she from li- crazy she perch. Hold on. She yeah. lives... She's lived in LA. She's lived in New York City. This makes mm-hmm. perfect sense There's to me. A lot of yeah, per- I just want to get. Sense. I want to get out. I want to just be like, bye. Like <laughs> like Neo from the Matrix. Like you're just fucking gone. Totally. I'm. You may crack. See you concrete. later. Gotta go. Yeah. Well, this conversation has been fun. Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah, yeah. not Bill and Ted. They're not going to wait for a phone booth to come down. No, you're no, saying no. Neo just. I don't go. care. I d- I don't need to be invisible. I don't want to like peep on anybody. I'm I'm good with that. You do your thing. I just got to go. I always wow. worry about people that want the power of flight, but they don't take physics into account. And neither does the mm. wish. And you take oh. off and everything, like your brain just turns to raspberry jam because you're like immediately accelerating and then everything kind of goes inside of you and you're done. That's cool. That's but if, if, At least if, you did it for a little while. Go. But if you <laughs> understand warp drive, you just you warp time and space yeah. outside of you. And you don't feel the effects. So you're yeah. a levitation being. Like, gravity. I remember going to the drive thru and watching um <laughs> uh what was Superman and the, the guys in the like uh, oh, the Superman oh. two, those were the Kryptonians. Yeah, the Superman two. And oh, then yeah. there was that one guy that was just like and it was yes. just the uh, most awesome thing. I was like, I would do that. That's All right. okay. Fair enough. So you I think you were your general Zod is I think oh, yeah. Wait, yes, which one exactly. yeah. thank you. Thank Which you. one was Richard Pryor in? That's the only one I really remember. Four? <laughs> the one with the sun god guy. That it was, was three or one. four. The one with the sun guy that Lex Luthor makes. Good. All right. Let's reel this in here. Oh, um, yeah. Question number two. <laughs> what age do you consider old? Oh, uh, uh, This is so hard because I just visited my parents. <laughs> and we were talking about like what it means to get older quite a bit. And, you know, my dad just turned 79. And we were talking about how dec- the, that changeover, the next birthday, is like a decade thing. So mm-hmm. it's like the decade thing. But then my mom said that now the 70s are like the new 90s. Apparently, people are living so much longer, whatever. I would say if I made it to somewhere in the 80-plus range, I'd be delighted. Okay. So, Indeed. I'm going to say like, you know, like, obviously, I want my dad to live a long time. But, you know, 80s... Between 85 and 90 is so 88, mi- 88 miles. Right an when hour. you start like crapping out, yeah, that's good. That's old age. Okay. Um, yeah. What is the worst haircut you've ever had? This one. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I love this hair. Um, the worst haircut I ever had probably was uh, the first time I decided that I was going to try going to a barber shop because I was cheap. And I was okay. just like, I'm going to go to a barber shop because I have short hair anyway. But I went to this like super cuts barber shop instead of like a proper barber. A proper barber. A proper mm. barber. And they just like totally, my hair was just yeah. bad. It was well, would you want to get whacked? You're going to go get whacked at a place like this. It so- was full on like Lynn, Massachusetts lesbian. Like that's okay. what it was. It was like not. I mean, n- nothing against a Lynn, Massachusetts lesbian. But sure. I didn't know that was a thing. I, it was yeah, like there's mu- a New England. Mullet, you know, like party in the, 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 uh, Billy Ray Cyrus. Party in the back. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was, yeah. I was in many ways hoping or thinking that you were going to suggest something more along oh, the lines of Oh, that's pretty that. bad. Yes. Um, well, that's when my grandmother used to cut my hair. So okay. So is this to, now for their audio viewers? This is more uh, like is a Gone a with the Wind. Lap? Yeah, that's more of a Gone. The curtains certainly are a Gone with the Wind. <laughs> 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 that's like the Carol Burnett thing when she comes out with the the pole and the curtain. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just my youth. That was like what I looked like my entire youth, and I didn't, you know, I didn't hate my hair, but I I didn't like like my hair either so okay so it's not coming like, back clearly i just don't think it's me i've guys. seen dudes wearing the mullet so I, anything's possible if i anything's can see possible. mullets yep especially when i got a pair of um clippers and i've been cutting my own hair during this 
pandemic mm-hmm. situation. So I feel like now that I can, I figured out the cut. I'm really just, I don't have to pay that extra 25 bucks. What That's do you do exciting. to the top? Do you scissor cut that yourself or do you use yeah. like, a, like an eight or something? It's like a, a um, thinning shears. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Because I've done everything except cut this the entire yeah. time. So I've got oh, like wow. a, That's gorgeous. Yeah. That is it, gorgeous. That's it like is a, warm. That's and like I, Brad Pitt in um, yeah. the... Uh, What's Legends it, the... of the Fall. Yes, Legends <laughs> of the Fall. Thank you. Andy looks like he's like a professional soccer player in Europe. Basically, yeah, for totally. all of our audio yes. listeners, would somebody tell my wife that? Nailing it. <laughs> Nailing it. Nobody's <laughs> significant others truly appreciate the majesty of. Oh no! Us. <laughs> anyway, they certainly do not. <laughs> I'm only famous in my own mind. Mm-hmm. So, one of my favorite questions, last one, number four: What is the worst job you've ever had? Oh my god! All right, so. You guys are not going to believe this, but I worked at the Parker Fly Guitar Factory. Really? Okay. Awesome. That's yeah. cool. When I was in college, Sweet. I decided, oh, this is cool. Like, I want to learn Where how to Where was it make... located at that point then? Um, It was, I think it was in, I want to say it was somewhere in, near Haverhill, Massachusetts. Somewhere, okay. I can't remember exactly, but I thought. I went and I interviewed and I said, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to Berkeley. I play guitar. I really want to learn how to make guitars. Uh, it was super interesting to me. And then I went in and they're like, OK, well, this is where everybody starts. And they put me as a buffer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey. And I literally what happened is the factory horn went off at like 630 in the morning. It was like, hey. And then I thought, oh, I'm going to meet all these musicians. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to learn how to make guitars. I'm going to be like wiring pickups and shit. And and basically the alarm went off. And then the first day I got yelled at for talking to the person next to me that was also buffing guitars. And I was literally like, and then the horn would go off for lunch and be like, we'd all go out into the parking lot. Nobody would talk to one another. All these like. Other Everybody people, would stare in a different direction. They would all go into their like old Camaros and like wow. smoke cigarettes and like nobody <laughs> talked to one another. And then the the horn would go off again after lunch. Go back in and I would buff guitars again, and then I'd go home. And like this, I it lasted. I think I lasted there three months, and I was and I didn't get moved up either. Like I thought for sure, like I'm gonna be learning how to you know cut necks and blah 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 whatever. No, I was buffing guitar for three months, just buffing away these Parker Fly guitars that I didn't even like. And uh, they yeah, look it like was murder a bust. weapons. I'm gonna say <laughs> Parker Fly Guitar Factory sucked, and sucked. that's <laughs> why. And that's why I didn't take that job at Gibson. Right. And I even, I at that point, even had experience. And I was like, I'm not gonna do this. No, but it, really it quick, Parker thing. Fly Guitar is, is that where you met Reeves Gabrels? No, that's so funny though. <laughs> you would think so. Yeah. You would think we would have met. In fact, it, um, Zach sent me, you know, some stuff to listen to that you guys had done, and I listened to the Reeves um, broadcast that you guys did, and I was thinking Reeves and I have crossed lines like so many times in our careers and in our like. I have to call him, and we have to go hang because we have so much to talk about. He's like, not too far away from me. It's just yeah, you know, he's in. What part of New York is Collar City? I can't yeah. remember it. Yeah, Collar yeah, yeah. I we stayed in touch a little bit after we did that event um, for Reverend, where we ended up playing with Reeves and um, uh, the was, Cure song Lullaby. Yeah, yep. yeah, we, we yeah. played with a couple of guys from the the Cure and did a cover of the song Lullaby. Um, and I was just I was like, the, I was oh man, that, wasn't I? I have got to Mm-mm. call Reeves up because actually, I um recently did a tour with jerry leonard too where jerry and you know jerry played with bowie forever and ever and um so we have we have so many things to talk about yeah really yeah um, all right so we are gonna quickly give a few shout outs here we run down um some of our top countries tuning into our audio podcast so we're gonna try our best to um narrate some of the pictures that i have planned here but uh once again india coming in in first place over the united states listening to the podcast india i love you yeah, i love absolutely. you guys um 
Austria's third, United Kingdom, Germany, France, Canada, Belgium, Colombia, South Africa. All you guys tuning in um, in all over the globe. We truly appreciate it. And now we have a shout out from Tanner Wirtz. Watch What's up, guys? This is Tanner with the Tanner Time with Tanner Wirtz podcast. I want to give a big shout out to guitar players who actually play Stairway to Heaven in guitar stores because maybe they just want people to hear how hard they've been practicing the fucking song. Just a thought. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Tanner. So that's deep thoughts with Tanner Wirtz. We are going to dive. <laughs> <laughs> that's how Stairway to Heaven started out. <gasps> As you were climbing the stairs. Let's, and let's coming in at number 98. Yeah. <laughs> let's With dive in. A million into, more to go. I'll let's bustle dive in into, your hedgerow. Got them all out uh, anymore? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. I'm fine. No, it's <laughs> good. I'm just joking. Before you go on, uh, you were freezing there for a second, Ward, and you're yeah, almost like you were talking, but you weren't moving. And I didn't know if that was like a new Jedi trick you were working on or. or yeah. What? Yeah. I had to. I, I have. I have <laughs> I've, you remember how you used to have internet problems right. years ago? So it's not me. It's not me this time. No, I'm oh. I'm in the process of remedying that. But luckily, this program is actually is hosted on a web server, so my interruption isn't what you guys are all fine. All right. Aside cool. from that, um, let's dive into all things Meg. Um, you've had a remarkable career from many of us that are musicians that really have not had a lot of the same experiences that you've had that you might say, Hmm, I wish I could have been on the, you know, playing at Madison square garden, or maybe you have, I don't know, but how did this all start for you musically? Um, well, that's quite a story, but I'm, I'll condense it a bit and say that I've, I grew up around a lot of music. My dad was a music teacher. And he played mainly saxophone and flute. Um, but there were always there was always a piano in the house and there were always instruments. And he would bring home different instruments pretty much on a weekly basis. He would be like, oh, here's a French horn. Here's a trumpet. Here's like a violin. And I got involved in music lessons pretty early on. My first instrument was the violin and I did it in um, school music. And then I took classical piano lessons uh, with this teacher that used to like hit your hand with a ruler, <laughs> like totally. Can you imagine it, describing that to somebody later on? Like <sighs> teachers used to be able to hit us. Yeah, they did. They did. Some of them that. had a massive beef with us and they just liked to hit us. Yeah. And I loved her, but I, I hated the, the classical structure. Um, so then when I got older, um, I started getting into my, I had an older brother who was five years older than me and he would, he really got me into like prog rock and stuff, you know, like we would listen to King Crimson and, um, it, Mahavishnu orchestra. And then, you know, obviously like bands like Rush and, and yes, and Pink Floyd, a, a, all classic rock too. And, um, so I, ended up getting a, a guitar at a yard sale one day my dad got me a nylon string acoustic guitar and I had played like a lot of different traditional instruments like clarinet and all that kind of stuff and never connected with anything and then he got me this guitar and I was like oh okay this is cool because I can play chords but I can sing while I'm playing I can um you know play percussively so it's like the drum set which I, I actually I played drums in in band for a long time too i was like the drum major in the marching band and did the drum line so i learned about drumming and then i loved rock music so much that it was like i wanted to be in a band and i started a band with my brother and my cousin mark who played drums and i played like bass and guitars and my my brother and i switched off and he was always older so when by the time he got to college he was bringing home like his college buddies that were listening to the pixies and all these like awesome you know bands in the early 90s and so i was getting like schooled on the weekends they would come home and we would like jam in like grandpa's basement kind of vibe <laughs> where you know like and all these these older 
guys would come home and I would have like my pink condo fame guitar and my brother would be like, Oh, this is my little sister, but she's cool. Like she can play. And I'd like rip out some solo that like Hendrix solo that I had shed it. And they'd all be like, Holy shit, your sister's amazing. <laughs> so I got like, I got brought up by a bunch of like guys that were five years older than me and, and listened to like the coolest music and, and, um, I was trying to like keep up with them always. So on the, they would like go back to college and then I would, they would leave me with like all these cassette tapes, like check this out, you know? So I listened to all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, I was like living a double life because I was also going through my own experience in, in music, in school and in high school where I was part of the drama club and like all these other elements oh, yeah. so and the jazz like ba -ba -doo -ba 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 -ba, kind of choir and like all these cheesy like classic you know high Acapella. school music pro yeah exactly Acapella. Charleston, on the weekends baby. i was like rolling up a pack of camels in my shirt because my brother's friends did that and like you know so it was like i was having these different call everybody doll <laughs> hey doll <laughs> hey doll what's <laughs> up doll. Um, but I was having these like very different experiences um, musically. So I got like musical theater, jazz, you know, prog rock, crazy like Indian music, <laughs> like whatever mm -hmm. my brother would like, you know, trip out on in college, he would bring home to me. So I was being like fed from all these different directions musically. And I also um, then I went to college. I, I decided to go to music school because I hated school. First of all, but both of my parents were teachers and they were very like, let's go to, you know, let's go to college. That's the logical move. So I said, OK, well, if I have to go to college, I'm going to go to a music school. Mm -hmm. So luckily I was good enough to get into Berkeley and I actually got in as a vocal jazz major. Which Really? I OK, well, hold on. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. How, OK, hold on. Yeah. Now. We, yeah. we let's let's really unpack that because <laughs> and I want to this there's a there's also a reason for this only because I've always been curious yeah. knowing that you went to the school but yeah. I was playing this gig um maybe a month and a half ago my buddy John and I played at a golf course it was rather boring obviously That's those great. they they pay a lot it was actually outside which is horrible in the summertime but this kid came up um after we're when we started packing up he was one of the five tables yeah um and the kid came up and he he gave a really nice compliment he was kind of timid and um so usually the logical thing is like well hey are do you play an instrument he says yes he plays piano yeah. I go, that's cool he's like yeah i'm pretty excited i got accepted at berkeley right. for piano and i'm like do you want to come I'm play like, the next okay. song with us? No, I go, dude, that is the worst place to go for piano. It's There's terrible. a community college right down the road. <laughs> yeah, it's worse <laughs> than the guitar. At least Sonsenberger's got a great program for you, buddy. When I when I got signed up to Berkeley, the it was like 90% guitar, you know, majors. And <laughs> I went in and I said, I don't want to be in a bunch of bunch of wanking guitar players. <laughs> like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I Sorry, Rips. I thought about drums and then I was like, oh shit, I don't want to carry around those heavy drums to every time I have to do a lesson. So I thought, okay, well, I can just sing. I can just right. show up and sing and hold on, hold on one second. So yeah, you're like, whatever it is, I'll go to college fine, but it's gonna be in music. Yeah, yeah. How did Berkeley become an option for you? And how did you pursue that option? Um, well, I just researched music schools and there were my dad had gone to Hart School of Music in um, Hartford, Connecticut. And, you know, there was a thought of like, oh, maybe I'll carry on the legacy of Tom Tui or, you know, um, but then it was so a academic. There were like all these courses you had to take. And at Berkeley, it was like, uh, you know, like American history won and <laughs> like nice. Spanish won. And that was we, it. We like you, had, you were like done. You're, <laughs> and then it was like, oh, you know, Afro pop rhythms and and you know the uh, history of of women in music or whatever. And I was just like, that's the school that that I can like, get down with going to classes and not just skipping all my classes and like hoping I'm going to graduate. Something you could be passionate about. Yeah, so, yep. yeah. 
so Can, so luckily, like I said, I I ended up, you know, I I I remembered the audition process, and I did an audition where I I I was really into recording at the time, and my my parents bought me a, a Porta Studio 424 Tascam. Oh track. hell yeah! <laughs> yeah, the best, right? Oh, I did a lot I of work on that one, one of those, here. man. Was that the oh, gray yeah. one? Oh yeah. Yep. Yes, yeah, everything yeah. they did was great. You would flip yeah. the tape and you could record more tracks. So you would like mix it and stack the tracks. Oh yeah, bounce, bounce. Oh them. yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. So I recorded my. I had to do like a video audition, and and my dad brought home one of those video cameras that was like this big at the side with like the boom mic on the end of it. And nice. I the recorded RPG a, sticking out of the the lens. Oh yeah, oh yeah, big time. <laughs> but um, I recorded a video of me playing a Juliana Hatfield song. Where I played drums, guitar, bass, and I sang, and I recorded on the Tascam and mixed it, and so that was how I ended up getting a scholarship because they were like, "Oh, here's a, a, you know, a woman that's mixing and recording and playing all these different instruments, or whatever." So I ended up getting a scholarship to Berkeley. And nowadays, it's it, it's something that you would rather have said, "Here's a multi instrumentalist." Yeah, exactly. It does not make a difference. It if does she, not make a difference. If she yeah, but is at the a time, he or like, he is it was a she, like, but hey, yeah, we can, no. we can be match our quota if we get another woman to go into the audio engineering department or good whatever. Good for the good for but, the tax break, but especially good for you because that yeah. worked out in your favor. That's it worked fantastic. out in my favor, a hundred percent. And I ended up um totally <laughs> going a different direction and going in the vocal department, which was like ninety percent women. So I totally screwed yeah. myself in that Fuck regard. It. Already there. Yeah. <laughs> but the beauty of that was so I went into the vocal jazz department and it was cool but it wasn't really my thing either and i ended up um getting to be really good friends with a lot of people that were in the mp and e department the music production engineering department and they would say oh god i have this assignment due and i have all these guitar players that i've auditioned to play on this tune mm -hmm. and they just want to come in and just like do the Berkeley like <laughs> the Paul Gilbert <laughs> stuff like all over <laughs> my recording. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, I can't get them to just play a melody or play like a, a cool line. So it's, I started it's saying the space in between the notes. Thank you. I started saying, Hey, I play a little guitar. Do you want me to come down and try it out? And um, I would go in and I would write these like simple guitar hooks and and then I started getting all these MP and E people calling me and being like, Meg, I heard what you did on Jamie's recording. Like, can you help me out? Like, come down. So then I started getting a reputation as a guitar player at Berkeley, even though I wasn't a guitar man, uh, a, a guitar major. So that's how I became a guitar player. Nice. You know, in a nutshell. So just on your riffs. Yeah. And then Eddie Kramer. Who, yeah. I was just going to ask know, you about that. Eddie. Um, obviously legendary engineer he worked with zeppelin and Jimi hendrix and kiss and he came in and did this clinic and uh i was in my 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 major was songwriting but my instrument was were, were vocals so i was in the songwriting department and i was singing but then eddie came in and he was like oh man i just want i want to um I'm going to record a song and then I want to find this artist and I want to break this artist. I'm going to get this artist signed, blah, blah, blah. So all these songwriting majors submitted demo tapes and said like, Oh, Eddie Kramer is going to record me. This is going to be my break. And, and, and for the kids out there today, it was literally a tape, right? It was a cassette. Yeah. It was a dat. <laughs> it was actually an a dat. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah. One of these. Electromagnetic. <laughs> <DHA>. <laughs> Similar little, yeah. yeah, little different, but yeah. And um, so a friend of mine was like, Meg, you got to submit your songs. And I said, no, 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 no. He's never going to pick me. And so she submitted my tape. And oh, this is movie material. Yeah. And I ended up getting picked. And then so I then I became like a songwriter and a guitar player because Eddie loved my guitar playing. And I wrote this riff for the song that was like this, like kind of 
um, Pink Floyd run, run, run with the delay, like dunk, 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 dunk. And Eddie Kramer was just like, yeah, that's it. That's the sound. That's the sound. So I did a session with Eddie and my song got picked and then it became like a press opportunity. And then they were like, Meg Tui, she's going to be the next thing for Eddie Kramer. And I got signed to a spec deal with Sony. And that's how like my career as a songwriter slash guitar player began back in the in the late Fantastic. 90s so we all here will vouch that mag Tui is one of our favorite songwriters no doubt and for those that don't know her um let me just pop up really quickly her website you which is do. just her name dot com oh. mag Tui. she's it also was a, there in a pinch too from what it I was remember. available yeah. yes um so let's see um you got picked out of how many submissions was it? It was a couple of hundred. It was it was a big, you know, it was a good it was a good deal of submissions. So So it was exciting. You graduate from Berkeley. Yep. Right? I had a record um, deal. We got a record deal. Now yep. this next picture that's here. Me. Yep. I'm a, I'm I'm guessing chronologically it's probably about that time. A little after, okay. but yeah, that was when I first moved to LA. So take us from, first of all, for the audio listener, uh, mm -hmm. Meg looks as if she's having a rather largely thick overalls. It looks perhaps a, a vest of some sort. Is in, the, I, in that, yeah, 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 yeah. What? What? How did you pick this outfit? What is this? I don't know. <laughs> somebody picked that for me. <laughs> That's that was like always somebody was picking that shit for me. It was like the manager was like, "Oh, you got to wear this. This is the look." <laughs> they were always wrong. I mean, it's cute, whatever. So now let's fast forward. We're done with Berkeley. You've you've obviously got a leg up over a lot of people that were going there in some regards. Totally. How did it? How did you make the choice to go move out west? Um. Okay. So I. After that happened, I got signed. I did. I was in this like massive bidding war right before bidding war stopped in the, the late 90s. Right. For record, you know, and there were there were such things as record labels that were like coming out to your showcase at the Mercury Lounge in New York. And there were like seven different labels and management. And they were all like talking to you while you're playing your heart out and being like, I'm going to get this deal, man. You know, and like my brother, actually, days. the same guy that I used to be in a band with, he was in this band called the Red Telephone in the 90s. That were the, the best band you've never heard of. Basically, they got signed to Warner Brothers at the same time as I was getting courted by all these labels and um, they got this great deal and they worked, they actually worked with Mike Watt and, and a bunch of like mm. awesome, awesome. Um, they went on tour with a bunch of great artists and they made a record that didn't sound like them at all because the label was like, Oh, we're, the radio head is kind of popular. So maybe we'll God mix, damn it. mix I hate that record the companies. Dolls and this and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> But that shit doesn't happen anymore. No, yeah. not it. Not it no, doesn't not happen like it anymore. No, uh, not, it, not like, like it used to. to. No, it wasn't like we're gonna take the dude from Finger Eleven and say, you know what, no. you need cataract surgery, and you need to shave your head, and he's like, what? What do I need to do hey. that for? Yeah, totally. Yeah. It, so they they had just gone through a similar situation where we both basically got signed and got dropped <laughs> within the course of like a couple so, of years of like oh, almost famous kind of thing and how, i had done the lilith fair circuit okay. and and had i toured with this these random bands like the saw doctors um in the uk and like you know, i was seen as like oh we're marketing her as the new chrissy hind because i was playing music at the time that was very much like a replacements kind of vibe mm -hmm. and like i had a rock band called the so-and-sos and we won all the boston music awards for like best album of the year new artist and blah 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 and um things were going well and then all of a sudden uh, the record label was like oh there's too many female artists we don't want to have any more the little fair is over so bye what the fuck? Yeah. Yeah, so then that it shifted to like boy bands. All right, hold on a second here. So Meg's oh. froze here for a second, but hold oh. on, folks. Oh, she's oh. back. She almost is back. It is intense to know what was she going to say. Oh, that, oh, the, the cabal shut her down. Oh. 
You were back. Oh my God! You must have said something yeah. that that, that did. the cabal didn't want anybody Justin to hear. Justin Timberlake was like, <laughs> somebody mentioned in sync. Shut it down. Shut yeah. it down. Green light. Um, green light. Green light. Meg, how can you yeah. dance? <laughs> yeah, but I remember um, working at Tower Records. I swear to God, it wasn't me this time. I didn't know nobody did it. Tower Records did it. What year is it? Somebody's trying to shut her down. I know. She is not a lot of spit. Go ahead, Meg. My kid's playing like TikTok videos upstairs. She's like, <laughs> TikToking, like some cool move is happening right now. It's shutting no, me a down. A lot of data being transferred. Yeah. Um, anyway, do you guys, am I here? Yes. You're here. Okay. You're present. Live. Um, yep. <laughs> what, anyway, Live and direct. I, I was working at Tower Records in Boston and I had played the night before I had played the Lilith Fair at what used to be Great Woods in Manchester, Massachusetts. And Great Who Woods was, on was the like bill? a huge amphitheater. Who was on the it bill was, for that one? It was Cheryl Crow, Michelle and Degicello, Emmy Lou Harris, mm. um, uh, Sarah McLaughlin, all these like huge artists at the time. Amy Mann. It's a lot of emotion. And it was, I literally, I was on the mega jumbo plex. And yeah. I was singing. I had Cheryl Crow right here, and I had um, what's her name, Ch Judy, the folk singer, famous folk singer with the long gray hair. Um, no, keep, I'm sorry. I um, I'm say going Judy Garland, but it's Judy Tenuta. Yeah, Judy, what good enough it for now? It was, <laughs> anyway, it wasn't Judy. And Tenuta. all these people, and I was singing this Dylan song like mm. at the end of the show. So the next day, I was working at Tower Records. Like, boop, that'll be. Eleven ninety nine, <laughs> and this person came up to me i was like ringing them up and they were like this is gonna sound really weird but i think i saw you on a jumbotron last <laughs> night <laughs> <laughs> that's 17.99 so, <laughs> yeah exactly so as you know as a guy growing up in the 90s i graduated yeah. high school in 96 yeah. um i probably mentioned this before earlier in our knowing each other but what my one of my top favorite bands in high school was the murmurs they were just oh I, man I, yeah. I i thought that their um self-titled first album um so they were good. like a um like a simon and garfunkel of the girls 90s thing for me yeah and i had i had a lot of fun um figuring out a third harmony because i just i i bought that album probably four times three of it used just because you fight in the used bin for like two bucks. And I was like, Oh hell yeah. Totally. Um, so what I wanted to say about that was I, I really enjoyed a lot of that music, but the little affair for me being a, a guy mm. always seemed like that was not a option. There's like, this is a woman's liberation, yeah. not even so much a chick fest, but it's, it's almost like a Christian rock concert. Like I am not going to go to that. <laughs> Right. <laughs> what was i don't think it was supposed to be i think it, that that's that's actually like what it wasn't perceptual. trying to accomplish it was trying to just be like oh it, actually there's a bunch of women out there that are really good at what they do too and and like it wouldn't it it was like Lollapalooza, but it was like the yep. you know the lineup wasn't all men it was all women and you could, you could yeah. say hands down also that Sarah McLaughlin, whatever that album is, it's black with her kind of in the center. Uh, fumbling towards ecstasy. You it's a cannot. Record. Yeah, you cannot. That is a perfect album. Mm -hmm. Give me give me a little bit of context to Sarah McLaughlin because I, it's not that I didn't care, but I'm like an ADA. <laughs> City of Angels but, movies. Uh, yes, okay. correct. But I'm like, <laughs> like ADA was a fucking fantastic That's song. That's that album. Yeah. Okay, well, whatever. Well, no, the one before that's even better, I think. That, that Did, was a great did Great Sarah record. McLaughlin write mm -hmm. all of it, her arrangements and everything? And at the time, her yeah. husband was the drummer, I believe. Yeah. Okay, Pierre but she Marchand. was she's telling him she was telling him, you know what, you're doing this. Yeah, four on the yeah. floor, don't, asshole. Don't deviate. No, what I want, no, what I want, the, uh, what I want out of Sarah McLaughlin's like musical lineage is that she did all that shit, and I, I, I didn't, I, I've never discovered that for myself. But if that would, oh my god. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's the case, but I do know that, uh, like, for instance, I work with Sarah Bareilles all the time, and she is running the ship on everything that gets made for her. Even she's working with T Bone Burnett or whoever, you know, like she's she's behind, like well, the yeah, that's working for me. This is not working for me. Let's get to that for just one moment, but take us really quickly though the decision to move to LA. Like, what was your 
you know, if you're working at Tire Records, you're in the Boston area, what was the decision? I'm out of here. I'm going to the other side. Well, because I got fed up as a front person and I'd been dropped from two different record deals and I was having a lot of luck playing for other people. First of all, I played for Lori McKenna, who's like the queen of Nashville and wrote like all of the last three years song of the years. Basically, she wrote, right. you know, Tim, Bo uh, Tim McGraw's Humble and Kind and, and uh, uh, just... Uh, a zillion hit songs in Nashville. Um, I was playing for her and she was having a fair amount of su success, but then I started playing with this band called the weepies. That's mm -hmm. very like uh, adult contemporary, you know, folk singer songwriter kind of stuff. And they were having a lot of success and they moved to LA and they were like, Hey, why don't you move out here? I was making good money playing for them. And I was arranging a lot of their stuff, um, writing a lot of their guitar parts and, so I said, you know what? I'm I'm gonna get out of here. Uh, I'd lived in Boston my whole life, besides going back and forth to New York a few times. And I was just like, let's try something new. And then I, I got out to LA and I was having success playing for a bunch of popular singer songwriters through the hotel cafe, including Sarah. And um, you know, I oddly enough, I, I auditioned for the pumpkins. Oh. A long time before Nicole became a part of the 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 for session. bass or guitar, for guitar, okay. and I I ended up playing with Jimmy a couple times. Jimmy and Ginger, they were the band at the, yeah. at the time, and I got to it was between Jeff and I. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I love you, Jeff. By the way. Yeah, I love, yeah, good, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a good dude. Jeff and I, and you, you can't be mad at that guy. No, I, I'm not mad at him at all. But but um, I'm so glad I. I would have never lasted 10 minutes. Let me tell you that. But um, for more than one yeah, reason. Yeah. I mean, so oh, I, 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 was I, th I think you would have level, like I was I was that was the company that I was sort That's of crazy. like flying in. Um, and uh, so I, I was doing well in L.A. as a side person and a, as a guitar player I was doing a lot of session work and I was writing a lot of um, jingles and things for commercials and stuff. So L.A. was was working for me but i definitely shifted gears from writing you know to mainly playing for other people and writing like under the radar writing jingles and things but okay. yeah, that's why i moved to la was to sort of try so, and make money for other people <laughs> in case people don't know <laughs> meg is a coveted tasteful guitar player I mean, she just does. And the pedal steel stuff that I looked up earlier was pretty cool too. Oh, I'm just Gifted. learning. I'm oh no, I love it's 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 in it had me entranced. That something that will be on my skill hard. level. I that is so can imagine. hard. Oh, I bet. It's literally the hardest instrument I've ever played. It's for a sure. different piano beast. guitar. It's a different beast. Piano it's violin cool. guitar. Yeah. yeah, all at the same time. It's everything. It's everything. It's like so, a complete mind melter. You were out now in Los Angeles. You're making a whole bunch of moves. Hell, you started a band, The Cold and Lovely. Yep. You had Patty, the drummer from Hole in the band at one point. That's that's the first, when I first met you. Oh, I forgot. I do have a picture of the first time that we met. Look oh, at that. Yeah. Oh. Look at, yeah. just Look at all that hair. Oh, what, Look what at, I, for me what or I, her. What I miss you with hair. Yeah, I know. I miss you with hair. Um, <laughs> I miss me with hair too, you asshole. Um, <laughs> I know, I'm speaking. I'm speaking oh. from not not a burn. Of course. Listen, <laughs> listen, I'm short. I can't wear stilts like one of you guys can wear. Like a bald person can wear a toupee. So, <laughs> it's too so um, you're out in LA. You're making a whole bunch of great connections, and obviously from my point of view you're just a great person so things are working out pretty well for people that are nice i mean zach's green so always says don't be a dick and you'll go yeah. far right Amen um, Amen. it's simple so i i should have got some graphics up for the cold and lovely stuff uh yeah. green and i especially are huge fans of meg's writing with the cold and lovely which have three out al three oh. albums mm -hmm. total one album two eps yep. or something yep. um her, we love every each and every one of them. Her I'm, Alice I'm, Bell album is one of my top three all-time yeah. favorite CDs in the fucking world. And Megan it probably wants to just move away from it at this point. No, not at all. <laughs> no? Not at all. I love that 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 time period. It was definitely like, 
you know, uh, obviously Nicole and I were together at the time and um, we wanted to form a band that was we based on our love, our mutual love for the music of the 90s. And she was in the Smashing Pumpkins and we would like literally listen to My Bloody Valentine and The oh, Cure and all these records that were love that band majorly mm -hmm. a part of our growing up in, in especially in, there's something about like massachusetts and alternative rock <laughs> like it's like massachusetts is just like this hub for really cool things that happened in the 90s and um so extreme yeah <laughs> besides extreme. sorry we're, we love needle <laughs> one of yeah. my three favorite albums is uh waiting for the punchline though the the most unpopular extreme album i didn't like it See, and then it, you it talk all, about it was Massachusetts. All about guitar, man, it was Barry Throne album, or was it like? Oh, it was, it was, it was very Christian. It, all I have to do is hear his what? name, and I automatically go. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So aside from this, <laughs> yeah. wait a minute. It. Wait, I have a quick. Can I ask a question? Oh, please. Sure, yeah. you, you're from the New England area, Ma Massachusetts yep. area. Yeah. When they're talking about like extreme and Nuno Betancourt, yep. do you listen to anything else from that area? Because there's a band out of Massachusetts named Elder. That I yeah, am yeah, oh enough. my They're god, I am totally. absolutely in love with yeah. that band. Oh my god. Hey, and there's the new there kids. We, there you there's go. There's the freaking new kids right there. <laughs> there's, look at these fucking new kids. That's right, new kids. So I was uh the picture for the audio lenser is um Meg with Donnie and Joey. Joey, that's right, Joey Joey. The sweetest guys Hell on yeah. the earth. Sweetest guys on the earth. Oh, really? Oh, oh. Absolutely. Like, so, le legitimately the greatest guys ever, both of I, them. Can I tell you this? I think that Joey went through puberty where his voice changed mm -hmm. from the please don't go girl or he couldn't go up that high anymore. Yeah. I think literally the same time I did, and I was really feeling it, man. I was <laughs> feeling it. it we, did, we didn't know what Joey was going to do. That's awesome. We didn't know what Joey was going to do, and neither did Zach. Oh, um, did it was a special time. It yeah. was a I love Magic actually. Moment. Magic I love the new kids in the block, man. Jordan was freaking awesome. He's a great musician, great he piano player. Oh, he I, sing his ass off. He's a I know that brother. album very, very well. Uh, my sister his was sister, a big uh, fan. Yeah. So okay. I have my sister to thank for getting me into like the cure and Depeche Mode and New yeah, Order and stuff exactly. like that. Some people have worse yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those those were the bands that mainly influenced all the cold and lovely stuff. It was that we were like Nicole was touring so much with the pumpkins at the time that I was like at home being like, uh, what do I do now? So I wanted to start a project that we could both be excited about. And although my background certainly was heavy in rock music and alternative music and all that stuff, it was also heavy in singer songwriter land. And, um, you know, I, Joni Mitchell and Bob Dylan and Carol King and all the, you know, people that I loved that Nicole was like one, one way. It was either like Bessie Smith and right. Nina Simone and the cure. And that was like her yeah. train of thought. So, so we decided to go with this like alternative shoegaze kind of vibe. And yeah. we were hanging with the guys from the silver sun pickups a ton. And like, so we were trying to like, create a sound that could carry on what she was doing in the pumpkin land and also like have this band together and from so a well, business point of view that's good pumpkin land yeah the pumpkin land yeah but that's a really good business move too if you think about it yeah, you know tried, yeah. you know she had at the time at least some form of fan base yeah. just by herself so i mean you don't want to like go from heavy rock and the hey check out my new album and yeah like country like it's a Lucinda williams you know it's like not gonna so, work out so let's get into the nuts and bolts of this you somehow bolts. you're in living it up in los angeles but you get this opportunity to go right back where you started which right. is actually part of one of your lyrics in the song on the new album which we'll get to yep but how did what happened there that you got the call to work on Broadway? Yeah, I mean, it was insane. So basically, Nicole's time had ended with the pumpkins, and she, after like basically four years of being on tour with the pumpkins, came back to LA, and we were kind of like, Oh, who are you? <laughs> uh, who are you? And then, just as we were trying to like reconnect after being apart for so long, I got a call from my friend. 
Sarah Bareilles, who had written this musical in New York City. And she wanted uh, me to come live in New York and play her show on Broadway. And I was just like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. And then she was like, oh, by the way, let me give you this guy's phone number. It's going to call you and tell you like what you make. And like all this, stuff. I, I know somebody that now works we're talking. Broadway yeah. playing guitar. It's a great living. Oh my god! And I got this <laughs> phone call, and I was just like, "What now? Excuse <laughs> me, I'm gonna get paid how much money to to play the same thing every night and like have a union and health insurance and all this stuff and like, 50. yeah." And so I said, "I have to go do this," and and I ended up moving to New York, and Nicole stayed in in L.A. and um. Then we were once again in a long distance situation and and I thought I was going to be there for a few months and it ended up that the show just kept getting more and more successful and and our lives kept shifting apart from one another more and more. And and I ended up staying in New York and um, it, here I I'm still in the New York area and um, the show just closed and I was in waitress sarah borellis's broadway musical for the last four years oh wait a second i think i have a picture for this is this yeah yep that's us that's the band so we've got meg sarah's on the far right for yeah. the video viewer and who are some yeah. of these other people i'm sorry um that's uh, so yair uh he's to the the i guess your left of sarah and the guy the tall guy is lee the bass player cello then the drummer and then the musical director nadia and then the keyboard player um adam we all basically played together every single night for the most part for four years besides one night a week we had off and mm. then two shows on saturday two shows on sunday so it was like a massive massive undertaking of um, you know, playing the same thing over and over and over yeah, again. What is night. that? Because I, I I worked in a similar thing. Broadway. For a little no 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 <laughs> situation. Not Broadway. Not Broadway. I'm not trying to appropriate your Broadwayness. No no no. But like you you perform the same thing every single night. Every. Crazy. For you it was every single yeah. night. For me hey, it was only Thursday through Sunday. That's the ones love it. Yeah, lesbians love it. Thespians. Really? I said thespians. Thespians. <laughs> wow. Thespians. I have my thespian card. Ladies somewhere. and gentlemen, Zach Ward is the only person that can get away with that shit. I will fi I will find it the next I have my thespian card my somewhere. I don't know where it is. <laughs> Why do you keep calling it a thes thes thespian? Because thespian Thespians. is a thespian. That's the name of my next record, Thespian. 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 <laughs> can I play on it? Please? You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> I finished my dirty Zach martini. Zach Ward and the Thespians. Yeah, that's the, Zach, that's a great name for your new band. Gonna... <laughs> yeah, really. Damn it. So, Perfect. I was joking, but some of us like repetition yeah. to some degree. To some degree. But go ahead, Andy. What did you want to make fun of? Well, what, no, I wasn't making Thespians. fun of it at all. <clears throat> way, to, way to turn I on mean, the Guys, it's not for the weak-hearted. It's it sucks. It for the most part, it's like there are beautiful moments where it's like, oh, the, I'm having the greatest night, and then there are moments where I'm like, poke my eyes out with a hot poker. This but then sucks. again, you look at the paycheck and you're like, oh, investment. Yeah, and then investment. yeah, oh. exactly. You get the paycheck <laughs> and you're like, oh, I guess I can do it again. I can do it at like a couple. It, it always manages to. It always manages to meet somewhere to where you're doing the same thing over and over again, and, and I'm sure you've again. had. Good yeah. nights and bad nights and nights no, I mean, that you've I've forgotten about. I mean, I've played the about. show about uh, 1,500 times. Wow. And Again, like I said, how many spins through space and time? Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the waitress, exactly. one of my favorite songs, by the way. Yeah. The waitress um, yeah. has been through Toledo. We have a we have a theater here that does Broadway. Yeah, yeah, Broadway esque productions. You're straight um, Sorry, yeah. straight ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I've seen numerous shows yeah. here in town, but the waitress had well came done. through. Yeah, it was good. It was a great show. It was really fun. It was a really, really, so, I, I got a lot of opportunities to play other Broadway shows too during that time. Like I was in on the Go-Go's show head over heels. So yeah. I got to hang with the Go-Go's and, and I worked on their musical when it was just being made. So I got a lot of the creative process. I worked with Duncan Cheek, 
a couple of different musicals. I, I uh, play guitar for his stuff, and I got to learn all of his weird, wacky tunings. And dude, I I want to say, um, I love that guy, man. Oh man, a, a, a lot, a lot of his his commercial stuff that he doesn't really like so yeah. much because I know he went Broadway, but like his commercial yeah. stuff again, so like good. if I if I could so write good. like that, fuck. I mean, he's a hell of a songwriter and he's a great guitar player too. Like, Oh yeah. He is. You know, I was talking about Jerry Leonard earlier in this, this episode and Jerry played guitar for, that's actually how I first met Jerry was that he was playing for Duncan and I was hanging out with these guys in LA that were all part of Duncan's band. And I went to see the play and it was like, his band was always incredible. His writing is always beautiful. His production is like flawless. And I have all these demos of these Broadway shows that he's done over the years. Wow. And to hear them not like crazy Broadway orchestrated, which even even in Duncan shows, they're never crazy Broadway orchestrated. They're still really cool. But like his demos are incredible. They're like the coolest sounds, you know, the coolest production. So... Duncan's like a real deal kind of guy. I, I want to try to keep this under a reasonable amount of time. And we're not, usually we have an after show and we're going to totally skip the after show. And oh, just, no. Yeah, yeah. We're just giving people the full no mantra here. For a, so I, I have a break. Because we the still full have. Full Montrose with Sammy yeah. Hagar. <laughs> well, we have, we have to get into the new album too. But yeah. before we stop talking about The Waitress and Broadway, for those of us that are musicians, I know Jeff. Um, Jeff is listening right now, and he's a saxophonist, and he owns a music store Ooh. in uh, Indiana, and that's yeah. why he was just making fun of saying hair is overrated. Thank you, Jeff, so much. But that's him and the icon playing saxophone. Um, can you give us two 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 questions? Can you give us uh, the feeling and what it was like for opening day of? The waitress. Yeah. What was that like? First? It was just shit my pants kind of feeling. Honestly, I had never done anything like that. Like playing a live thing is one thing, but like for the first couple months of waitress, I literally was freaking out every night because it's a whole different thing. You're part of a show where there are a couple numbers where I I started and the the person on stage was like in this deep moment and then all of a sudden they had I needed to cue them to start singing and if and if I was wrong it would have thrown off the whole moment of the show like if you put the capo on the wrong thing like you're fucked you know like oh, yeah. and a couple of times that that happened and, and it never was me knock on wood it never was sure. me it was always like a sub that came in and put the capo <laughs> on the wrong thing or whatever because there were two guitar players in the show but it was always that kind of thing and on top of that the way that Broadway works is that while the show's going up and throughout the first like opening sequence, you have about two months building up to that opening where you don't have a sub. So if you have the stomach flu and you are wearing a diaper on stage, like mm. it's a real thing. Like th this happens. Like you can't sub out. You have to show up no matter what's happening in your body. Oh, if you're wearing a diaper on stage, you're subbing out. All right. No, you're you're not. <laughs> you're not. I actually there were a couple nights where I had a bucket next to me in case I had to puke on stage. God damn. Like okay. you could not sub out. You just had to show up. You just had to show up. So it was this level of intensity and and performance where not only that, but like because it was Sarah's show and there were like famous actors involved and things like you know, we had people show up in the audience that were huge, legendary, you know, icons showing up and, and you'd be playing in front of these people in the we, audience. We forbid the word huge, by the way, just huge. for political reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, we're, we're really quick. Speaking of which, uh, since we're not doing the after show, I have to fucking take a piss. Oh, no. I will be right back. Okay? Oh, wait, oh, Meg, play, play, your, play your thing. Play the thing. All right. <laughs> oh guys charge it's, all right meg it's just you and i um yeah. I've waited for this moment my whole life here we I go know. um yeah we i made the decision that we're not doing an after show today because usually we cut the show at 45 minutes and we're already creeping to an hour so I, I'm going to take it back. I have two more questions about the uh, Broadway 
the quick the first one is I hopefully rather quick or whatever. What is the most memorable like goof up screw up that ha- I mean you played fifteen hundred shows or so. Yeah. Was there something that really went bad that? Yeah, all the time. I mean, I mean, all the time shit happened. Like, especially when there were subs that didn't know what they were doing. Like, we had these moving platforms, and one of the the guys that you know, um, the Conti brothers, John Conti is like a big bass player in New York City. He's a great bass player. He was subbing for our bass player, and like, he's he's much shorter than the bass player that plays and you're you're not allowed to move around anything like even if you're a drummer and you're way shorter than the the original drummer like you can't move the kit like you can't do anything like or else it's like you get flagged as like oh you're the sub that moved the cymbal around so so anyway so conti was on stage and he's like playing bass and there was this moment when our platform like flew across the stage and he stood up because he couldn't see his chart and his chair flew out onto the stage and was like rolling oh, no. around on the stage. And there, there, there were like so many moments. There was a moment I was playing. I had to play from a table in the diner. There was like mm-hmm. this diner setting, and there were all these things on the table, like a ketchup bottle, salt, and they were all contained in this little like um, condiments tray or whatever. And my in ear pack got wrapped Ooh. around the tray. And like in the middle of a scene, I I went to go joined the band again and I pulled the entire contents of the table onto the floor. And oh. like, so the actor was that, that was acting at the time was just like having to make up like a story of like, Oh honey, leave that there. I'll get that for you. Don't worry about it. You know, like, oh, that's so awesome. Broadway show. That, when I was, yeah, uh, there, but it was great. When I was a little kid, my dad had to shave his mustache off so he could be in uh, the Toledo opera. Are you serious? Yeah. I'm a hundred percent, a thousand percent serious. My dad had always had a mustache, always. And one morning he comes in, I'm like seven or eight years old, and he had shaved his mustache off because he was going to be. In, I can't remember the name of the play. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it at all. But he was a butler, and he was supposed to deliver a turkey to a table. And there's video of it somewhere. But they had shaved my father's mustache off so they could put a larger, more substantial mustache ah. on my father. <laughs> And as he's walking across the stage with this plastic turkey on the tray, the turkey slid off. He didn't like move it. It just started sliding off of Mm. the tray. So the turkey bounced across the stage. (laughs) And that's the beauty. Damn it. That sounded so interesting. I'm sorry. I missed it. (laughs) So last question about Broadway. Okay. You got some inclination that the show is going to, it's coming to an end. Everything has a beginning. Everything has an end, right? What's the semi-sonic line? Every new beginning is some other beginning's end. Anyway. Close enough. COVID. I can hear you. COVID time. Oh, yeah. COVID I can hear you time. sing it to me in my sleep. <laughs> COVID time. <laughs> hey, let me tell you something. There's one thing I definitely know. I know who I'm going home with. Yeah. Well, anyway, I so know. that's what it is. Well, <laughs> I know tonight. who already had it. Meg, you, you got the information. The show's gonna close. What was the what was the whole you know, there's an ending to this, of course, but what was the the last show like? Hold on. You might be frozen. Oh, she's mad. Tick tock. Oh, she does look mad. Oh my god. Wait a minute. Oh, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're, we're not per, we're not Fuck. like professional perfect but anyway meg um uh yeah it, i was really i was really like happy to be honest okay. that we got the closing notice because i needed somebody to tell me it was time to move on from it you know because it was like i'm collecting this paycheck this is awesome but i was also like I, I'm going to kill myself soon if I have to play these songs every night over and over again. Right. Um, but at the same time, like it was surreal after doing it that long to like realize that it was like the last most, most likely it was the last time you were going to play those songs with those people. And, you know, it, it definitely becomes like, I don't know if you guys ever did any theater in your life or went on a, you, you know, when you're on tour, no, tour, only in grade school. And like the tour ends, and you you had like the greatest three months of your life on the tour bus or whatever, and you're no. you you play the last show, and you're like, oh my god, wait a second, this is 
ending? Like, what it, What am I going to do no. now? So I, I've had friends try to explain that to me. Yeah, yeah it's, we've it's never. Weird. I I've weird. never witnessed it. No, myself. I did. I I I will tell you that I've done. We've done shows about it before. I was part of a haunted house, and you'd yeah. get mm-hmm. really really close to the people that you did the haunted Catch. house with because you'd do yeah. the same thing every night, mm-hmm. four or five days a week. For yeah. two months at a, a month and a half at a time, and then you'd see and who would make over. it to the next year. But yeah, but then you'd see who'd make it next year, and that would make it even way more sad because oh, I guess they're not coming back this time. Mm-hmm. Andy, well, Broadway's really also it's a series of endings because you get so attached to everybody involved in the show, but the cast constantly changes over because they get other gigs or yeah, you the know first their lady contract was is up. really good. Yeah, the first Jess. Lady. Yeah, Jessie was amazing. She's incredible. She's one of the greatest singers I've ever worked with. Um, but you know, you get attached, and then they're gone, and then you know, you saw them every day for a year, and then they're gone, and there's a new person in their place, and it's like I, I have a new a diet. girlfriend. All of no, I, have a fucking I know that. Well, it, remind, it reminds it reminds me when my good friend Andy stopped working at the same place I worked at. Oh boy, that's a good point, Andy. Andy I'm, no longer. Andy's uh, back to college. He's not with Reverend anymore. I love and miss all of you. Actually, I That's, I really do. And, and this yeah. is what makes the podcast even better. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you don't have to deal with knowing what's going on in my life at any other time. You never. Oh, call. whatever. <laughs> whatever. So let's get to the um, last portion of this podcast. And thanks for everybody that's uh, hanging with us in the live stream. And we can see all the comments. You're more than welcome to keep going with that. Here we go. Now we're up to Meg came out with a first of all, she had a single that you could buy off the new album in December 2019. Because on my iTunes, I've got a one song laying by itself. And then when I the album actually populated in 2020, thanks, Meg. It's kind of divided up. Yeah. That's fine. You came out with an album called Butch. Yep. So this We've had the blessing of having um, our friend Ricky, who came on talking about his coming out in the military, which also was his getting kicked out of the military. So if you want to learn about people's coming outs, Ricky's episode is really good. Um, We've had a person that's a poly that has had relationships with men and women. Really? run the gamut i i was like yeah. wow you've really been talking to some peoples yeah. out there and they're all wow. for the most part they're all friends um all topics uh, bizarre so, and risque are on the table yeah well i don't even like to look no. at it as risky they're just friends yeah. Yeah, yeah whatever so they're all topics then yeah in 2013 <laughs> you know what we just need <laughs> you got that meg, nailed <laughs> meg there, we need to make a different window like a picture in picture that whenever something Your bad hand. happens you just start playing hey, hey guys when we get big enough can we hire her as an organist i was gonna say are you the Gee. new paul schaefer because <laughs> i think you're the new paul schaefer. i switched to whirly <laughs> all right Ooh. Yeah, she is the uh, simple bless me, Paul Schaefer, minus Fucking, the glasses. Uh, Animal <laughs> yeah. Crossing ass soundtrack up in this. Yeah, so exactly. now we're talking about Butch, and everybody that's listening, I encourage you to find it. If you want to be a, um, a, a, how do I say this kindly? Let me rephrase this. You can stream it, and. Stream it. Meg can get a whole maybe three quarters of one penny from your stream, or yes. you can um, purchase it on iTunes and various. I'm assuming if any Amazon, yeah. and, and then it's she, everywhere. It's everywhere. And at least she makes um, a, a better portion of that, which I would suggest to you. But the album Butch um, not only is it amazing, but let's talk about LGBT topic. Yeah. What does Butch mean to you for somebody that maybe is not in that community? Well, that's interesting that you asked that because when I first decided to name the record Butch, I, I told my mom and I was like, oh, yeah, I, I've got this group of songs. I'm going to name it Butch. And she and thought she, it was derogatory. She was like, why would you do that? Why would you do that, <laughs> honey? I, I don't understand why would you, you would like put yourself down like that. And I was like, mom. In, in my community, the word butch is like a term of endearment because that's, you know, 
I've always identified as a as a gay woman as like a butch woman because I've I've always been like a tomboy and I've always been more understanding masculine energy than feminine energy. So the term butch to me is like this like you're female and you have all of these you know sort of masculine traits but you also have this softness to you mm -hmm. and and in a, in the queer community that's what the word butch means is that it's it's like you're the person that drives a pickup truck a i have a toyota tacoma i'm just saying that fuck oh, um, yeah yeah and that explains uh, that question then because you have a pickup truck <laughs> and yeah. you're Album. I got a pickup truck, you know, like I, I know how to build shit. This is an ISO booth that I just put a wolf on that I built myself, you know. Like, I think that the wolf was was a, a question earlier. We were talking yeah, about. Yeah, I saw that. Wonder, so yeah. This is a, my um, my father-in-law is a, grew up, my, my partner grew up on a Pueblo. And so she has all of this Native American stuff, which like I have shit like this. <laughs> you know, oh, like, my <laughs> moose. Like a totem, so um, you're, so you're. you're my, you Thanks. identify butch, but you shave your armpits clearly because everybody yeah, saw I, that. that I, I don't have time for that. That's just okay. nasty. So um, well, I I shave my armpits. <laughs> do you? <laughs> yeah, I do. Show yeah. me. Zach and I but both like, do. It's, it's, it's basically. I don't know if I can pull my fucking. Wait sleeve the up. wait the fucking second. I'm the only one on the Simple Blasphemy uh, podcast that doesn't shave. I don't like, shave I don't like hair. I do not I, like I, hair. I can't pull no, it up. Like I, don't I don't either. I don't. I don't. I don't like. It looks like the 1970s. Yeah, it's, just for the just for the for you, it's like butch. You you know, it's it's, it's how you like identify. Up here. It doesn't have to be anything specific necessarily. Like you don't have to. It's 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 about a hardness and a softness and balancing um, those two things. And I I love actually in in the Native American culture they they call it a two spirit person oh. that has has yep. traits of male energy and female energy. And I think that there's a balance between. The two of those and me calling the record butch is just like a way of being like this is how i identify and these are this is how like you know i feel like i have the softness and the hardness you know and right. i'm balancing those two to it's an I, like, I like that one story when you were talking about like when you would wear your brother's belt mm -hmm. but it was too big for you and it would like yeah. drag on the floor <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I was just with my parents uh, uh, last night in, at their house in Vermont, and um, they were talking about how when I was a kid, they should have known that I was gay because I used to That's pretend that I had multiple personalities, and my my multiple personalities were like chick and bonk, and they were both these guys, and they wore like my brother's clothes. And hmm. one of the things that I did was like I played country music and I wore like a a, a leather belt and a leather vest. <laughs> and like, so, so I don't know. You know, read the signs. Read your kids' signs. It's yeah. funny to be able to look back at it after the realization. After you have been, you're like, this is this is who I am. I'm going to tell my folks, and your folks are like, that's who you are. Yeah. Now we can giggle about the fact that you were wearing a belt around oh, and a leather vest. Before that, to shame anybody before they've discovered who they truly are is a dick yeah. move. It's I, a dick I, move. I, I got to hand it to your folks. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, totally. Super awesome. Totally. Meg. And, you know, my parents and I came through a lot of struggles. Obviously, like, being gay in the 80s and the 90s was not as cool as being gay oh, <laughs> as and now. It, and what like, did your mom write into your 21st birthday card? Yeah, that's <laughs> that's actually a line that I sort of like nudged so that it would fit a rhyme. But the truth is, like when I came out, we had a you know, we had a really hard time as a family. It was not like a a fun experience by any means. But my parents like really learned a lot. And my mom now, like when we talk about it, she says that she considers me like a her biggest teacher in that moment of like, wow, like she didn't realize, you know, that she had a prejudice or she had like a, a feeling of what, what it meant to be a gay person. And now she's just like, Oh, you're, you're gay. You're gay. Whatever. You know, mm -hmm. so, can, I appreciate you, that. can you talk a little about a little bit about, um, you know, uh, your story, you go to Berkeley and things started to change for you with the girl that you're in a band with, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're kind of figuring it out that 
um, you have a preference that uh, society at that time was no. better than it was years ago yeah. before that. However, can you just talk a little bit about navigating the navigating to find who you are in that respect? Sure. Because I think a lot of your this, this album, Butch, is like you took, it feels like to me, you took your diary and you just like threw it and said, here, everybody can read it. And I encourage everybody to look at oh, it. It's some serious fucking lyrics. Yeah. Read yeah, it man. with your ears. Shit. Yeah, I, I appreciate you recognizing that. And, and honestly, like, so in that time that I was telling you guys about when I was first coming up and I was signed to these major label deals and like, it was not cool to be gay. It was like a ex- mark on your shit you were like oh well we can't market you because we can't sell sex you know we can't sell this we can't sell xyz there isn't enough gay people to market to yeah or or you're gonna be you're you're melissa etheridge light and i was like no i'm not i'm not melissa <laughs> etheridge thank you no i'm not <laughs> much respect for melissa etheridge but that's not who i am no. and i don't want to i don't want to be that and i'm not katie Lang, and you don't play and innovation not, blah, blah, blah. So. yeah never <laughs> never <laughs> And Sorry. like can she please let go of the ovation. And, and thank time? God you didn't try to that you weren't forced on that road because the, some of the music that you created is some of the, the backdrops of my life. Oh yeah. Thank now, you. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong. When it comes I mean, it's to stuff that's really time... touched me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I just didn't want to be labeled as a gay artist. So I fought so hard against it to the point where I like lied about everything. People were like, Oh, are, are you gay? You know, like whatever. Like I just always lied about myself and it sucked and I hated it. And I didn't want to lie about who I was even to my, my it doesn't aunt and define uncle. who you are. Yeah. My aunt and uncle showed up at a show that I was playing and I was dating the girl that opened up for me and she like outed me on stage. And then afterwards my aunt and uncle were like, Oh, are you gay? And I was like, no, no. She she was talking about somebody oh, else. Like, hell no. All this like dumb stuff that didn't matter at all, and it was so dumb. And they don't care at all, and they're so supportive now. And I kissed anyway, a girl, and I hated it. Ugh. Yeah, I've been I've been year, <laughs> years of that shit. So when I when I finally did this record, I was just like, I'm I'm gonna be 44 this year. Like, what have I got to lose? I'm just gonna be honest. I I married a woman. I broke up. I got divorced from a woman. It was horrifying and terrible and so sad. And then I fell in love again. And I'm and now I have a, a twelve a, a ten year old and a and a, you know, I'm living in a totally different situation. And I just wanted to share these experiences because this is like real life shit. Whether you're gay or you're straight or whatever, like this is normal shit that you you have relationships and they don't work and they work and. So I'm going to tell my story and and this record was a way of me like just being like finally saying very clearly this is my life this is who I am and hopefully this is going to affect people and touch people in a way where we can all relate to one another and no, it, was, can, you know, I, it touched it me it was I'll definitely an intense album oh. yeah man it it you know, I have. I was thinking about what I wanted to say too. And again, here we're kind of fanboying out on you, so pardon us. But I love it. Or just fanning, I guess would be. Dude, I didn't even. Show. I didn't even fan out this I'm bad. Out I, didn't even, I didn't even fan out this bad when I met Eddie Van Halen. <laughs> <laughs> He's cool. He's a cool guy. I was like. Dude, how can I get away from this guy? Why does he want to continue <laughs> talking to me? So, but what because like he this? was like Zach Green, teach me. Yeah. Teach no, me. No, Zachary. no, it was nothing like that. I was like, oh my god, you know my childhood friend. I want to talk to you. I remember you telling me. Yep. Oh, we need to hear that story again sometime. We need to re up on that at well, some well, point. Well, uh, later. So, hold on a later. second. Yeah. So <laughs> really, really quickly. Um, I thought about um, a, a lot of different scenarios of what I wanted to say during this interview. And uh, Meg, you've been a fantastic, at least better than a little better than an acquaintance for me. Um, personally, we, we chit Same with me. Yeah. Homies. And we, we, ch I try to send Meg a message a couple times a year and just to keep things alive. And, you know, I, I, I 
love I, listening I, to music. And, and, and just really quick, I think I messaged you somewhere along the line of one yeah. of your websites about how much Ellis Bell meant to me. But you know, I thought you probably like, like who's this Yahoo? Yeah, I don't, I don't you know, realize it was like me that worked at Reverend that you know. But, but no, I, I want to message you again. If you just give me an email, I, I mean, I, I got like I got I other like, stories. I, I have like six <laughs> of the guitars you built. I think uh, your signatures. Are mm. Oh, dude, I remember <laughs> every one of those guitars, man. That was the build. Right? Yeah. yeah, that was yeah. the build. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, I play that thing all the time. Dude, every every I every, taking every, pictures every of that. time I see you with one of those in a video, I am just fucking tick tickled pink. Oh yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, well, I played all um, waitress. I I played a tricky Gomez and a in a charger for years, yeah. four years. That's amazing. Uh, and uh, and a warhawk too. Oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah. that famous uh, green one. Yeah, green yeah, green one. warhawk. Yep. yep, totally. So yep. getting back to what I wanted to say. <laughs> I don't. I forgot. I what? Ask, like, <laughs> like, like in that in that in that music video, Dow. Oh, the yeah. cars, the the, the yeah. um the Mustang and the Impala. Oh, totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that thing was awesome. awesome, man. I'm a so, car guy, and like I was just fell in love with those. Life. That was the best day yeah. of my life. Awesome fucking song, awesome yeah. video, yeah. awesome cars. Yeah, check awesome it car. out. Whoever wants, check out that video, Dow. Yep. Cold and lovely, fucking awesome classics. Totally, that's a good tune. You can, and before I try to say my compliment, um, you can use this whole video version of the podcast for the restraining order later down the line <laughs> it's totally fine yeah this is really bad i'm sorry <laughs> so <laughs> it started again yes, <laughs> all right so well i got new songs coming out um starting august 20 so i don't i don't know if you guys know this but i i wrote a whole nother record at the last in the covid times oh definitely so hey, it, finally, somebody that did something with their COVID time yeah. rather than build some shelves like I did. I didn't do shit musically. Well, I got to I, I I start fucking pinball my team. It's well, coming out one single at a time starting end of August. First single's being released. Well, we'll obviously be buying that. Well, but it's, what happier I want... than the la and it's happier than the Butch record. It's, oh, whatever. It's more but like petty. There's, there's love petty stuff vibe. in there. I, what I'd like to say is... You know, and the other, you know, works that I've listened to or admired from your catalog was it was always um, I admired it. I admired the approach to a lot of, of the different of all the songs. Um, you have a, a, a great way of um, phrasing things, even like the song Compass. And you take this idea. Oh, I love that fucking song. Yeah. So I love that song, man. I fucking jab it in my fucking system <laughs> up here, man. Full blast. That that song sounds really good, fucking loud. God, I gotta <laughs> mute you now. Anyway, <laughs> no, it's not me yeah. tonight, motherfucker. Uh, it is I'm not you tonight. Now. So no, it's fine. No, this is. She needs to hear this because we need more of it. Um, you take this idea of this compass thing, and you take a whole, uh, you make a whole thing out of. Something so simple like a compass saying you're my true north, or there's a, there's a whole bunch of different cool phrasings um, throughout everything, and the Butch album is no shortage of that. Um, they had the fire and you're the gasoline. Do you have mm -hmm. these really cool? What's your approach? Do you, do you find something that pops in your head that's a really sweet phrase that you just kind of write around or? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the times, honestly, it's like. I, I start playing something and I start singing gibberish and some line comes out and then I attach myself to that line and it creates the rest of the song. Yeah. And um, that is pretty much all, always the way that I write is that I sing gibberish while I'm writing. And then there's one thing that I'm like, shit, that was good. I'm going to like write a, it's that like a, mu a musical phrase, right? Yeah. It just comes out and then it dictates the whole rest of the song. Right. And I'm lucky that that happens to me. I, don't, I, I think it's from years of like, my mom was an English teacher forever and ever. And one of her thing, her specialties was poetry. And she used oh. to read Emily Dickinson poems and all these like great poets. And, and um, you know, I, I, I would, I grew up on really having a lot of respect for great 
literature and great writing and, and, and poetry. And she would help me. She would sit with me and say like, oh, well, wouldn't this be clever? And like we were we were hanging out the other night and um, she was talking about a blue heron that she saw and she was comparing the color to like a weathered barn board. <laughs> and I was like, Oh shit, mom, like you're amazing. <laughs> like, that's awesome. so good. Like, so I grew up around somebody that was so tuned into descriptive language. Um, that, Imagery. Yeah, totally. That, that I think that because of that, it, it really shaped my ability to come up with that, the, you know, relation to the the lyric and that's, and where it can go awesome. and how many ways it can go and trying to find something that's clever and patting yourself on the back when you do you know and, see, and, I, so see, organic no, wait, songwriting so you're, you're lucky yeah. because like you got that influence and you had that you know that kind of at least yeah just influence is a really good word for it and then there's people like me that was introduced to like andrew dice clay and that <laughs> And that type of rhyming just doesn't translate well. No. <laughs> you know, and, about the Hubbard, go and, fuck and yourself. And that brings me to another thing. Um, I, and I'm sorry. I, I I'm always going back to this album, Ellis. I love Ellis, that album. Ellis, Dave Ellis, Cooley, you know, Dave Cooley mixed the shit out of that record. He dude, really I, did an incredible I, job. Literally, I, I, I when I tell people that's the backdrop of my life. Like my, my dream world. When I dream at night, that is the fucking sound oh, soundtrack. Man. Fucking playing. That's I, so I, I, cool. There's something about that. I don't. I, I just love it. That's probably the favorite album that I've ever recorded for. For oh me. my god! And, it, and it, 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 just to hear you say that. Yeah. I'm like, oh, that's awesome because I'm like, oh, you know, I, I was thinking here say, oh, that was just some extra stuff we had left over. No way, no way. That was that was li literally when I dreamed about the cold and lovely. I, I thought that's the sound that I wanted. Oh, and it. We tried to make it more pop in the following record, and it was cool, and I was happy with it. But that was the sound, like the Ellis Bell record, was the sound that I had had envisioned for that band. And that's All why right. I, I was just wanting to email you some stories after that, but really quick. Yeah. It's talking you're talking about literature and your mom yeah. um ellis bell was that yeah. of the Eng english 19th century um bronte. emily bronze yeah. bronte? emily bronte the, it was her pen bronte? name yep. yeah her, her pen name what yeah. so really what, i don't what, know yeah. So what part of it was it about her actual real life to where it was kind of like it was kind of like unique and not too much is known about it or did you yeah. was it based off of her only actual published novel Withering that Heights. got you Withering yeah Heights. exactly exactly yeah. i i wrote the song ellis bell after after reading Withering heights uh, yeah. i for the like ninth time yeah and some but, say that was like the greatest novel ever written yeah i think it is it's like the, <laughs> it's one of the greatest love stories because the the main character is basically falls in love with this this woman that he can't have and then you know he she marries somebody else and he like you know, loses his mind over her and then she dies. And it's like, it's like this epic love story. And so Ellis Bell was the pen name of Emily Bronte and she in the Withering Heights is, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the storyline of, um, the, the song Ellis, Ellis Bell and on that record. All right. So awesome. I'm, I'm, I hate to be this guy, but we're going to have to call this because our show, you, album. Our, shut sh it down. our show is, <laughs> yeah, I know. Shut it shut down. down. We're done. Our we're show done is only 45 minutes long and we're pretty An much hour and a half. Oh, man. Nobody's yeah, pretty, the only person left watching is like well, some, some <laughs> mom, probably mine. Uh, Meg's gonna be like, I just had the greatest interview ever. These <laughs> fucking straight guys love me. I know it's amazing. Fucking idiots. Oh, <laughs> Who are you calling straight? I, I, again, that that one song and uh, uh, not not with me off your first was it the oh, first yeah. album? Yeah, people Dude, said that if, that if, was the if we would have had our, our Pete Anderson telecaster out by that time, you could have used it in the video. Yes. <laughs> mm. So that song is awesome. The video is awesome. Check Thank it you. out, everybody. Not do do with me. I, do I'm it. with you no. on that. So I'm gonna throw up Meg's. It's Meg2A.com, M-E-G two T O O H E Y for the audio listener.com. Meg, if you could just we we have to call this. This is the longest episode we have, and I have no problem with this conversation. <laughs> because of but um, could you just One nutshell answer. your? Right um, <laughs> there we go.
Um, I just I just want to thank Meg for not playing right here right now by uh, Eddie Van Halen or whatever that stupid. Jesus Jones. Wasn't that Jesus that Jones? Or right now, yeah, right here, right now is Jesus Jones and the King hey! of D. By the way, I thought, I thought you guys were gonna just talk to me about guitars for like nine hours. I, I don't had, like, do all guitars. My guitars out. I was like, dude, uh, in dude case I, I don't want to talk about guitars. Show the guitars really quick, so we, so we can say the, the things have happened. I mean, you I have a shit all... ton of guitars. You can't see them all because we I don't. Can't move my... We don't talk work, Meg. All right, we don't talk right. work in this thing. To be honest just, with you, I thought you were gonna talk about guitars. So, could you give the elevator pitch on the the album Butch yeah. to encourage anybody that hears us to where they can find it as well? <laughs> okay, and um, why they should get it. You can find the album Butch by Meg Tui on Spotify, Amazon. Uh, iTunes, whatever you listen to. Um, the reason why you should listen to it is because if you like a lot of different, uh, I, I feel like it blends a lot of different styles. Um, Definitely. From, from everything from like a cl classic country to like a George Jones kind of vibe with some pedal steel and blah, blah, blah. But then it's got like a, um, a Neil Young kind of element to it. It's got a... Uh, more Tom Petty kind yes. of modern singer-songwriter yes. kind of thing going on. Covers the gamut. Yeah. Um, I've been really interested in listening to old Clapton and old Springsteen lately. So a lot of the stuff that you're hearing are those influences. So I'm trying to bring back those kind of 70s ways of recording and also song styles in in the music that i'm putting out right now because that's the music that i've been feeling lately so dude and and i loved it it was really it was really a a, a deep look in on yourself thank you and i yeah. and i always appreciate that when anybody wants to share yeah. that side of them yeah and yeah. i hate to say that's, that's yeah. awesome it was a great album you. you know having the the time that i've the very limited time that i've spent with you or had conversations with you but after listening to the butch album it's like i i can honestly say i love you i think i love everything about it there's a really deep connection that i think anybody can really get and i and you know i feel like this meg paid for this to be some kind of like infomercial talking about her album <laughs> but no but it's actually no, I, really true and I you have to hear it for it. yourself yeah, I mean, I've we been give doing the same credence to everybody. I've been doing this a long ass time, and yeah, yeah. I, I'm a fan of music. I really am, and I feel like I try to like pay respect to all of the music that I love. Even like, you know, I reference Dark Side of the Moon <laughs> on some you, shit you, that I'm doing, and like, you are a craftsman. Yeah, you are I, a craftsman. I, love I love music. I love guitar tones. I love playing with with like different textures, and I love writing and trying to find new ways to say the same thing over and over again artist you know? and a craftsman all right well that's basically this is a two show in uh, one because we're two, at one hour two 30. Oh, I two just one. Talking. mag you've two got one. the record for the longest show you, yeah you definitely no do hair. No, I'm <laughs> Longest show ever. Every day hey, i'm sh bubbling. <laughs> <laughs> Suck it, um, Reeves. Look at these. Parker <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. Fly, fuck you. <laughs> yeah, fuck you, Parker Fly. So, uh, Meg, hold on. Um, we're going to do our little outro here. Everybody that listened, thank you so much for hanging out. And share this to somebody that you um, might find beneficial, whether it be just a musician or somebody that is trying to inspire to be a musician. We have a young lady that started from knee high to a toadstool and pursued her dreams. And it's, I've enjoyed this whole conversation. So, oh, yeah. True. Hey, guys, one thing I want to say yeah. is that I don't know how, but I'm a part of this awesome music festival with Ringo Starr and like okay. all these amazing, like Ringo Starr, full stop, but Patty Smith and all these people on Rolling Stone. Uh, if you check out my Instagram, which is me too okay. e on Instagram, you can get all the details, but it's it's this coming weekend. I'm going to be playing a song um, with all these incredible artists. So hopefully that'll push, yeah. you know, 
my awesome. my music out into the atmosphere. Somehow. I will definitely oh, yeah. be checking it out. So that's a really good point because uh, I've finished my martini. Where can people find you before we adjourn here? Um, honestly, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on whatever. If you could follow me on Spotify, I would love you forever because my yeah. my following on Spotify is like so minimal. And yeah. for some reason, that's all that people in the entertainment industry give a shit about is that how many followers you have on Instagram. Put on your playlist. Yeah. So so um if you can follow me on Spotify at Meg Tui, I would I would love you forever. All right. Oh, Meg. Hey, and, and Meg, really quick, if if you get a uh, email from some guy called Voice of Reason, <laughs> that's gonna be I'm me. And I, 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 and I got some and I got some extended stories about the album and, cool. and I'll the send you some I, I've got some demos and stuff I'll send you just to awesome. 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 see that's why we did this podcast. Oh, there you go. Two, oh, two, over two years strong. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thanks everybody for listening. Meg Hake Tank for one second. And yep. we will see you guys next week with who do we have next week? Hold on. Ah, we have Neil, Neil P. Neil P from Neil. Downtown Brown. Whoa, um sweet transplant from detroit to la so we're gonna see what's all thing neil oh, p yeah. and downtown brown we'll oh, see you yeah. next week right thank on. you guys so much thanks meg